Okay, let's talk about uh, GPS, Oops. GPS, GIS, and remote sensing. Let me just get my little pen going. Alrighty. So, GPS, GIS, and remote sensing uh, has a lot to do with uh, these satellites here. Um, let me kind of, uh, well, to start off with, hopefully you've kind of gone through a little bit of a, what the coordinate systems used are with mapping, uh, you know, longitude and latitude, that sort of thing. So you want to have a good kind of basic understanding of what that is before we launch into this, because that's essentially what this is all built off of. Uh, and all three of these, GPS, GIS, and remote sensing, um, it, they're all kind of involved together to kind of make this this large um, science. I mean, this is essentially uh, sort of the science and data of, of geography, which is, you know, global, geographic. I mean, the words are there in the, in the titles, but anyway. So first I want to start off with uh, the Global Positioning System, or GPS. You've probably heard about this. Oh, my phone doesn't have GPS anymore. Uh, and you've you know probably uttered those words. Uh, although, your phone sort of has two different ways of locating itself. One is with GPS satellites and two is with uh, um, cell phone towers. Most of the time it's using cell phone towers, but also whenever you turn on uh, some mapping software, it'll usually talk to GPS satellites. But anyway, so how does uh, GPS work? Don't get too bogged down with all these words. I actually just, I liked these. I pulled these off of NASA's website, but uh, it's, starts with over uh, 30 satellites that are in orbit uh, around the planet. Um, and different countries kind of have their own GPS system. Uh, well, your phone will either talk to, I forget the name of it, but the American sort of constellation of satellites. Um, and I think it's called Nexstar. And then there's a Russian one. And those satellites are kind of all over the place as, as well as American ones. And then there's some that India uses. And then I think others... Uh, that Pakistan uses, I forget, but those satellites just sit straight over on top of their countries. They never, um, they never orbit anywhere else. But anyway, consists of over 30 operational satellites. Uh, and the way this works is the satellites don't necessarily exactly pinpoint where you're at. They're more of these clocks that your device will, will talk to. So they're super, super, super precise clocks. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, share a little video on kind of the basics of how uh, GPS satellites work. But basically, your uh, your phone will talk to a satellite, and your sat or it'll send a signal to the satellite, and the satellite will say, "Oh, I received this signal at exactly this this time." And based upon the time it takes for that signal to reach the satellite, uh, you can figure out about how far away you are from that satellite. Or really, the satellite sends uh, the timestamp to your phone. And so because these radio signals travel at a fixed speed, which is the speed of light, this is why we need these crazy, crazy precise atomic clocks. Uh, but because that signal travels at the speed of light, we can figure out just exactly how long it takes to get uh, to your phone or to your GPS receiver. Uh, and so we can know about how far away you are from that satellite. So problem is, is from that satellite, uh, we can kind of create, so, so you know how far away you are from the satellite, but you don't know exactly where you are. You might be 500 miles away, right? Well, are you 500 miles away into space? Are you 500 miles down somewhere on Earth? Well, where on Earth are you exactly? Well, you need to talk to multiple satellites in order to kind of triangulate, or more precisely, trilaterate tri where your position is. So you basically need four of these satellites uh, to figure out exactly where you're at. So how does triangulation work? So with this example, I'm actually using sort of cell phone towers. Uh, it only takes three of them because we're kind of in a 2D plane here. We're considering that the surface of the earth is kind of our our, uh, our fourth sphere, or our fourth circle. Well, yeah, sphere. But uh, the way it works is your cell phone, uh, your, where you're at, your smartphone here, will talk to this tower and the tower will say, oh, you're one mile away, 
but I don't know where you are. You're just one mile away. We could be here, it could be there, it could be there, it could be there. So your phone needs to talk to another tower. Okay, well, it talks to this one. So this tower then says, well, you're somewhere along here somewhere. You're 0.65 miles away. Well, since we've talked to this tower and this tower now, and these circles uh, cross, we now know we're either here or here. So we need to talk to a third one in order to figure out whether we're there or there. And so we talk to the third one here and we're 0.43 miles away. And so it ends up being you're located uh, somewhere in here. This is the exact same method that's used uh, when we talk about earthquakes and we try to figure out where earthquakes are. Seismographs or seismometers. Uh, it, it sort of works in the exact same way. We'll know that a size, we can tell how far away an earthquake is from any given little seismometer, but we don't know which direction it is. We need to use other seismometers to triangulate, or rather, trilaterate, trilateration. Pretty much everybody says triangulation, although technically it's trilateration. Um, to help figure out where that earthquake is. So this is sort of the, the same method. Except uh, in a three-dimensional world, uh, we can't just use three towers or three satellites. We have to use four to figure out exactly uh, where we're at. So if I ask you that question, how many satellites does it take to figure out your location on the Earth um, using GPS satellites? It takes four. So what do we use GPS for? Well, here's a list of a bunch of things we'll use GPS for. I just type these out real fast. Uh, driving, farming, construction, um, the maritime industry, the military, and GPS was basically developed by the military. Uh, emergency professionals use it. If you watch that documentary I posted on, uh, on landslides, there was a really neat scene there where they were in a helicopter and you could see the neighborhood kind of laid out in their little heads up display. You can see where the different lots were at. Well, they're using GPS in that helicopter and to try and figure out where these houses used to be located so they can try to figure out where people are. Um, plus, you know, I'm sure uh, dispatchers all the time are want to know where the, you know, the closest police officer is or the closest ambulance ambulances. So they're using GPS trackers on all those cars and all those uh, emergency vehicles to figure out who's closest to where. And I'm sure it gets much more, more complicated than that. But uh, essentially, you know, GPS makes that sort of thing possible. Uh, pilots use it to figure out where they're flying. Um, I've flown a lot in smaller bush planes in Alaska, and it was kind of wild to sit there and watch these pilots. The, their planes, even though some of the planes were fairly older, uh, they still have the technology in them, and the, the pilot's just sitting there doing autopilot, and they're basically piloting from an iPad. I was kind of amazed, and, you know, you kind of wonder, it's like, well, what if your battery runs out? <laughs> are you going to be able to, do you know where you're at? But, um, you know, pilots use them heavily uh, in, in just about every industry. If you want to know where you're at, if you're trying to do something, um, if you want to be able to share that information or track it for later on, uh, it, it's just about everywhere now. You know, we're all carrying around cell phones. Uh, we, that means we've all got a little GPS sort of uh, device in our hands, and we can communicate with these satellites to figure out where we're at. So it's, it's just everywhere now. Uh, so something I've personally used it for, I'll kind of give you a little story of, of one of the projects I've worked on, uh, is we use it to kind of track uh, pollutants. So uh, story time. So uh, for one of my projects, uh, I was out here uh, on Atka, which is this little island right here um, on the Aleutian, the, uh, the Aleutian, Aleutian Island chain off the coast of Alaska. And to kind of, if you don't know exactly where you're at, uh, Washington State is down here. So the rest of the lower 48 is down here. Uh, so let's zoom in a little bit. I'll get a little bit closer to Alaska. And this, this is me essentially using... Uh, I'll talk about GIS in a little bit, but this is basically me using the geographic information systems, uh, using a map to try and share this information with you. So I'll zoom in a little bit. And what I love about this, uh, to kind of take a step back and just talk about the geology, you can see this plate boundary right here, where you've got the Pacific plate subducting underneath uh, whatever plate this is. And when it subducts under there, it eventually gets low enough that melting starts to occur and you get this long chain of volcanic islands that stretches for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And that's what this 
uh, this island was. So now I'm going to zoom in kind of into this little area right here and we'll kind of look at it uh, side on so you can actually see these volcanoes. So there's a little volcano uh, right there and there's another one uh, right there. And so the kind of three main volcanoes on this island. But uh, anyway, so the reason we were here was there's this small native population down here on the, what's called uh, Atka City, I guess. It's just called Atka or the village. And they do a lot of, uh, there's a small cannery there. They do some fishing and then they, they ship that fish off elsewhere. Uh, but during the, uh, the Cold War and soon after World War II, this was a little hub for submarines. And just in general, there was a military presence here in addition in World War II um, in our fight in the Pacific. And we left a lot of the material there. We left uh, you, barrels of used oil and sludge and grease and diesel. And a lot of that didn't get cleaned up. And so, you know, I have this native population that's living here. And the water that they're fishing in out here is getting affected uh, by these pollutants. So my company was kind of called in to uh, remove this stuff. We basically knew where it was. And so we went in to, uh, to remove it. So here's kind of a small piece of the town. You can see the church right here. Um, and where we were working was in this area over here. There's a little stream that lets out. Uh, right here and the local uh, population actually did a lot of fishing for shellfish and everything out into this little bay so you had this this creek that was basically just flowing right through this heavily polluted area and then coming out uh, into this region so I'm gonna hop over here now and we're gonna look at it from the other direction so now the town is back over here and here we are kind of doing our work you can see this little creek right here flows off into here and this area was kind of the contaminated area and you can see all these little pink pin flags down here uh, we were kind of delineating it trying to figure out exactly where where this location uh, was at so there's the town back here again and so here we are uh, trying to remove this contaminated soil so here's kind of what that looks like so we've got this little uh um, bobcat here we called him something different out there but uh, and we take soil with this excavator and put it into what's called these super sacks uh, and actually this one was where we we found the uh, the used drums and the really nasty stuff we put into here and then the, the dirty soil we'd load up onto this trailer and then drive it over to the other part of the island over here to load it up on barges but what my job was to do is come in and take soil samples and we needed to prove that we had removed all of the contaminated material. So I came in and took soil samples and got GPS locations of all the different uh, little spots for the soil that was all around here that I did later on uh, to, to try and remove that soil. And so part of it was I sent off the samples to have them confirmed at a lab. And then I had my own sort of scientific equipment to try and help me out. To try and guide these guys and say okay this stuff is contaminated over here or over here or over here and so you need to remove this stuff put it in these bags and i come back later on and take samples of the soil that was left over and see okay is it contaminated no okay we're good and we've kind of figured out where the extent of this this contamination was but i'm taping gps coordinates all along the way well how did i do that so i actually used something that's a little more advanced than your phone. And I wanted to show this because of what is down here in this hole. When we covered topographic maps, uh, I talked about benchmarks. Well, there's a benchmark down here. And what I wanted to do is bring this little station right here and put it exactly about two meters above uh, this benchmark, because that benchmark is sort of like the defining characteristic. Remember when I said like, those benchmarks are define those those areas. If there's a benchmark that says this mountain is 2,532 feet high, that that defines it. Not no satellite information, no GPS information can change that. That benchmark says 2,532 feet. That's how high that thing is. So this little spot sort of defines this location. And so I'd leave this thing here, and this is my little staff. Uh, that has another little receiver that'll talk to this one, but also this thing is talking to satellites and so is this one. So we can get super, super precise uh, data 
that's much more precise than your phone. Your phone can get down to maybe, you know, three meters or so, a couple of yards. Uh, well, when you're using this stuff, you can get it down to a couple of centimeters. So when you're taking soil samples, you know, that are a couple of feet apart, uh, you want to be able to get that kind of precision. So this is, you know, kind of how it, how it works. And this is the little device I'm looking at, and I, I don't have it keyed in yet, so my, my errors aren't, uh, aren't uh, super precise, but you can see I'm talking to 15 satellites, which is good. Uh, and my accuracy, I think, is about 1.3 meters. That's kind of my error, so I'm not really talking to that little base station yet. I had to hook it up. Uh, this is a little video just kind of showing the area and, and what it's like there if you're curious about the work. Uh, you can download the, the slides for this uh, as you can kind of, to kind of help you take notes, and you can play this video. I'm not going to play it right now, though. So this is another site uh, on the same island, just a little bit further away. Uh, same sort of thing. We've kind of found the area where these diesel drums used to be. So there's all sorts of diesel fuel right here, and it's kind of getting into this lake. Uh, and so I kind of came in, used my GPS, kind of set down the points, uh, and kind of just created a, a perimeter. And then we set up our little office here, and it's super windy out here, so we're, you know, we're tying it down to these uh, big heavy items. Um, to try and keep it from blowing away, but this sort of became my office and I kind of create a little makeshift uh, map of that spot and all my little sampling locations, but in my data, you know, what I record and in that in that little GPS receiver is I'm actually taking points and labeling these things and these are sort of my little preliminary values of, uh, of the uh, equipment that I was using to try and figure out, okay, where's the really nasty stuff? And so this one Really nasty, 118 parts per million, I think is what that is. Um, so we definitely wanted to remove more material there. And so this is kind of my office, you know, great view and everything. And this is the piece of equipment I'm using to kind of uh, sniff at the dirt. And I'm kind of taking, writing down my little sample values and, and taking GPS coordinates along the way. And then I'll kind of go back to our house on the island. And there's another method we would use that was even more precise uh, to really try to help us like make sure we're getting good data and we're going to remove all this stuff because I'm going in here and I'm also taking soil samples and shipping them off island and sort of that's the uh, the real deciding factor of did we remove it or not. And if those samples come back and say, oh no, you didn't, this is still really contaminated, then, you know, this, this didn't work out very well. But the reason I'm doing this is so that I'll get good data. So here we are removing the, uh, the dirt. And putting into these super sacks, and there, you know, we we had a challenge of trying to get this back to the town. This was five miles driving along tundra, and these old World War II roads. You can imagine what a World War II road might look like um, on this Arctic or almost you know subarctic island. After many years, there's hardly a road anymore. But uh, we found a guy, and we bartered with him on the island, and actually got this old World War II trailer. Uh, that, that broke after just a few days, but it was just, we got just enough use out of it that we were able to get all these super sacks down to where we needed them. And they eventually get put onto a barge and shipped down to somewhere in Washington State where they had a, a landfill that would take this kind of uh, material. So that's kind of the story. That's what I'm using GPS for and kind of a real world, kind of real uh, environmental geology problem and how it can be really useful. So in addition to geology, uh, agriculture um, will use this. So here we've got some soil sampling uh, that occurred on a farm. And there's all this different stuff listed out here, but I see soil P1 and parts per million. So I'm gonna look down here, see soil P1. I'm guessing that's phosphorus. Maybe some of you ag folks know better than I do, but uh, so they're basically getting the different phosphorus or whatever P1 is, these values all over this farm. And you know, if, if you're a farmer and you know that, oh, my plants aren't growing great or they need phosphorus, maybe you just dump phosphorus all over your entire farm, but that stuff is expensive. It would be great if you can just kind of pinpoint the areas that need it the most. So this is what's called precision farming. And this is just taking soil samples, you know, every however many feet between these little locations. Uh, well, this is 240 feet, so it looks like about every 250 feet or so. Well, imagine if you took, you know, more soil samples and you got even more precision out of this. You might find that there's actually a spot right here that needs more phosphorus uh, for whatever reason. 
So the more more samples you can take, the better. But then it costs money to take samples, and so it's all about the economics of it. But you know, so this farmer can now come in here and just apply it to the areas that that need it the most. Um, and some of the neat technology that exists with that is, you know, today we've got you know GPS systems that'll hook up to these machines, to your tractors, to your combines, uh, and they they autopilot. They can drive exactly where they need to drive. They can apply this stuff where they need to apply. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, uh, the combines and the tractors they had uh, in that movie, which is supposed to be set like in this dystopian future, uh, they're they're piloted by GPS. There's nobody in there driving them. There's not even a cockpit. Uh, and we're, we're not that far away from this technology. In fact, it already exists. Uh, and a lot of farmers will just kind of sit in there and play video games and, and let the, the tractor kind of do its job. And they're just there to do the, the really kind of fine detailed tuning that they might need to do and make sure it just, you know, goes off well. But uh, so that's some of the some of the uses of uh, GPS. But um, so anyway, let's move on to remote sensing. So remote sensing, what you're doing is you're using sensors from satellites or Today, even you're using drones and planes uh, to look at all sorts of effects uh, across the planet. So the really one really obvious one is weather. You're look you're using satellites to watch the clouds to try and uh, track the weather and see what the weather is going to do. Uh, you can track uh, back to agriculture. You can track crop health. Uh, you can look at uh, infrared uh, reflectance or infrared light off of crops, and you can tell how healthy they are or unhealthy they are and what you might need to do about that. Uh, you can track wildfires, floods, there, there's a bunch of different things you can do with satellites uh, to look at the earth and find out you know good information about it. But one of the big, 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 big uh, things is definitely crop health and weather, you know, just agriculture in general. So here is a uh, agricultural field and this is um, I believe this is an infrared. That's got to be. So basically, the redder, the more reflectance you get, the more infrared reflectance you get off of a plant, the healthier it is. So we can look over here and we can see these spots uh, that aren't as reflective. And you say, oh, these are not as healthy. Okay, we need to go out and apply something there to make them healthier. And you can look at the actual crop over here that doesn't have the infrared and you can see little areas that are, you know, you could probably tell this over here might end up looking like one of these blobs over here. But uh, you, you can tell these areas of crop health where you might need to do something. And uh, traditionally, satellites have done this. Um, but what's kind of neat in the modern era, you don't necessarily need to use satellites. You can now use drones, which might be a lot cheaper to use or even more precise because a satellite may be hundreds of miles up in the sky uh, and they can only see, you know, maybe one meter at a time versus a drone can fly just a few feet above your crop and can see really, really, really fine details. Um, you know, a drone might be able to fly over your crops and you might be able to count, you know, the field mice. And so once you get too much field mice, then you say, oh, I got to apply a, a pesticide or something. Um, I'm not going to click on this link, but uh, this is a, a company that actually specializes in, the, in GPS tools, uh, but they have their own sort of agricultural uh, section with products and I really recommend kind of just clicking on that real quick looking at some of their products and seeing like what's possible in today's world and the technology that exists because it's it's pretty cool like and it definitely sort of makes it you know we're, we're in the future um, so another application for remote sensing this is actually something I worked on when I was in college here at the U of A uh, this is Montserrat it's a volcano in the Caribbean uh, sea the Caribbean islands and it knocked, you know, it, it did a lot of damage to the uh, to the villages around here. And here's a satellite image. So again, remote sensing. Even though it's just a picture, technically it's remote sensing. But you can see where these flows have gone. These are probably lahars uh, that have flown all the way out here. And you can see where the villages are all over here where the people live. And you can see that if you get a large eruption and you get a lahar coming down here or a flow, it may overflow these banks and get out here into this populated area or simply the ash that's blown around from the, uh, the island. But what I worked on uh, was we got LIDAR data and I hardly knew what I was doing. You know, this stuff seems complicated. And I, you know, I was a young undergrad and my 
professor I worked for for 10 bucks an hour was like here, so, you know, just sort of threw it at me and figure out what you can do. But uh, they took this LIDAR data and LIDAR is basically, uh, it's a radar with lasers. And what they were doing was they were flying a plane over the, I think it was a plane. It might've done a plane and a satellite, but I think it was a plane where they beam these lasers down and it hits the land surface and then it reflects back up and tells you the exact distance between that, that, you know, your, your laser and the, uh, the ground. And what we were looking for was really, really sort of precise, uh, changes in the volcano, looking at where it was bulging, where it might erupt again, uh, and just the changes that we were seeing to try and figure out, okay, how is this thing evolving? How is it changing? What can we expect next time? Is it going to erupt down here again, or is it going to do it on the backside uh, and erupt off uh, that way? And it's a fairly cheap thing to do, to just have a plane go up there with you know, with LIDAR on it and, and just fly over this every now and then, so you can track these changes. So this is uh, an example of remote sensing. So what about GIS? Uh, GIS is just the mapping component of all this. It's just kind of the mapping science. So it's taking all this, taking the remote sensing, it's taking the GPS, and it's taking that information and putting it on a map. Google Maps and Google Earth essentially does this. If you've used those applications, that's what this is. That is GIS, that is geographic information systems. Um, you go look at the weather radar, right? That's geographic information systems. You've got a a satellite up there that's looking at the clouds, you've got a radar down here that's looking, you know, a Doppler radar that's looking at for the precipitation, and they're taking that, they're putting it on a map, they're figuring out the locations, they're using GPS satellites to help figure out the locations, and putting it on, you know, a software application. So that's all this is. It's a big scary work for basically saying app science. Um, it's geography, both scientific data. Modern geography. So why do you care? Well, hopefully you can figure out from some of these other stories why it might be useful. Uh, but precisely one of the things I did want to mention is, you know, one of my biggest regrets as a student was I never took a GIS class. I never took a remote sensing or a GIS class. I really learned how to create this stuff and use it. And I kind of regret that because it would have opened up a whole lot more job opportunities for me. Um, so it's definitely a growing field and there's different levels of folks who work on this stuff. You know, the GIS technician, he's the guy out in the field with the, you know, with the, the GPS receivers, like that stuff I showed you, uh, that I was using. Uh, the specialist is sort of the person that, that will take that information and kind of put it into the map, start utilizing it. Uh, and there's analysts and it just kind of goes up and up. So you folks that are, and I know I, I've always got a handful of students that are into computer science. Uh, or software engineering. So if, if you find this kind of data interesting, this kind of mapping information data, which is very much a growing field and will continue to grow, um, this is a world you can go into. I mean, GIS developer, guess what? This guy, I'm sure he knows C++ and Python and all sorts of programming languages. And it's sort of creating the software applications to take what these guys are creating and to you know put them into to applications where you know a consumer or a government or somebody can use them. Uh, and of course, you know, these folks too. And you know, these are, that's, that's not a bad salary. And I don't even know what that is. <laughs> but um, anyway, just wanted you guys to know that, uh, that this is kind of an option and it is a field you can sort of go into. Um, and there's, there's a lot of support there for it. So some things you can do with this. Um, one simple thing is there, there are, you know, if you go get on your local uh, assessor's website, the assessor is the county person who you kind of pay your property taxes to, for those of you that uh, may not own property. Um, but you can look at land ownership. You can figure out who owns lot, what, where, and how many acres they own and when they bought it. Um, you can use it for census information. You can map out rivers and canals and flooding. Uh, there's something called FEMA flood maps, which you can go look at if your house is in sort of a flood zone. Um, all, all sorts of stuff. But essentially, you know, kind of what we're doing here from an existential standpoint uh, is, is we're kind of taking all the information we can get from remote sensing, right, from satellites, from drones, and anything else, any information we can get on the ground, and we're sort of, we're kind of modeling the real world. We're sort of creating this, this virtual reality. We're not necessarily getting into this virtual reality and, and running around in it, but 
like a video game or something, but we're, we're sort of recreating a model of the world to help us interpret it better, to help us make better decisions, you know, like, oh, if this is in a flood zone, do we really want to put this here? Or what do we want to use that land for if it is in a flood zone? Um, I use it fairly heavily for work, uh, looking at property owners. So, you know, I may get a call and say, oh, there's an illegal, you know, there's a environmental hazard here, an illegal dump or a spill or whatever. And I need to go figure out, okay, who owns this property? First of all, I've got to go find the address, figure out who owns it, uh, figure out potentially who's responsible. And so I'm, I'm using this information and it's out there free to use. Uh, another local sort of way that it's utilized, and this is kind of the last thing I'll show you, but if you ever drive north and south on 49, so NWAC is up here, <coughs> no, the Rogers campus is up there, uh, and then Fayetteville's down here. And this is kind of Springdale over in here. But 49 has this weird bend in it. It doesn't just go straight across here. It bends way out. And the reason for that is because of Cave Springs. And this cave system, there's this whole cave system down here that exists. And there's, you know, um, certain species that live within this cave system and people use this for groundwater. And if you ever, if you've never driven through cave springs, you know, if you ever drive up and down 49, I highly encourage you at some point, uh, just, just drive down 112, drive down 112. It runs north and south, just like 49 and drive through cave springs. And there's a little pond there that you'll see. And if you go to the back of that pond, it's like a football field or two back there. There's a little hiking trail back there. You can see water. You see basically this small river or large stream just pouring out of this cave system. And this is the drainage basin that is feeding it. And you don't really want to put a highway on top of something like that, especially a bunch of caves. You can imagine, you know, building the infrastructure of a highway across areas that are hollowed out might not be uh, a good idea. Uh, and if you want to actually see this map and play with it, I put the link right there. Uh, and so you can go pull it up and you can pull up this GIS map. And there's, if you... If you click on the, the little uh, legend on the top right, you can, there's some other things you could turn on and off. You can see the different drainage basins around uh, Northwest Arkansas and Oklahoma. And so where all the water goes uh, for Beaver Lake and everything like that. So it's pretty neat stuff. If you're into mapping and kind of this kind of technological stuff, I highly encourage you guys to like go out there, look for it, Google, uh, see what you can find. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So anyway, that is all for that and then we'll kind of have a lab that's attached to this uh and that'll probably be either be posted in uh, in canvas or we'll actually do it in the classroom